Right. Um, hi, everybody. Yes, my name is Joseph Fisher, and uh, I think it's a slight discrepancy here because I was told that uh, I could come over and tell you something about our work so that if somebody's interested, then they could say, hey, I could come over and see what, whether I can do something like this. And as it turns out, this is an international uh, seminar that I'm going to present uh, my work, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so the point is, uh, so this, I don't know what kind of seminars you usually have. This is not a seminar where we are, where we are going to prove theorems or, or have longer derivations and whatnot. The idea here is uh, to kind of engage you in, in the thinking of, okay, so there's math, there's pure math, there's applied math, and there's a bunch of things that you can do with applied math, and um, what are the interesting problems uh, that you can use your applied math knowledge for, and this might be one of those. So the idea would be, again, that I talk and then you interrupt me. I don't know how well it goes in this department. In our department, it goes quite well. Uh, so, the work that I'm going to present, uh, basically, is together with a bunch of um, former postdocs and graduate students and uh, long-time collaborators, uh, uh, which, whose name I'm not going to mention during my talk, but uh, uh, I can tell you if you're interested who did what. Um, the outline of the talk is that uh, I'm going to give you a kind of very general, very brief taxonomy of uh, what do I mean by computational methods uh, in, um, in our kind of field. Uh, and then I will just uh, bring up a, a case study, which would be vision. And we can discuss what vision is and how vision is a problem or not a problem and what you do with vision and what you do with computational methods in vision. And then I will just go through uh, one particular line of reasoning, thinking, or, or research that uh, we are pursuing in the last 5, 10, 15 years, uh, which starts from the, the idea of uh, a probabilistic approach to the issues that uh, we investigate uh, then with a particular hypothesis uh, on, on uh, how the brain, because that's where I'm working, in the brain, how the brain does things, whatever it does. Uh, and then um, uh, some confirmation. So this would be a nice demonstration of how a theory that you're uh, kind of putting together in your armchair uh, would generate some, some uh, testable predictions and how you can go back, actually, and collect data to, to see whether the predictions have to do anything with reality. Um, a little bit spinning it over and over, and then two points that I, I highly doubt I will be able to get to when you say, once you have this theory, uh, what other steps you might have uh, that you might want to try to, uh, to see whether the theory can uh, uh, give even more insights about how the brain works. And then um, this is absolutely something that's not going to happen, I think, but uh, mostly what I'm going to talk about is, is related to neuroscience. Um, but uh, this last part is actually behavior science, so something that uh, you can measure in humans. And you can see that uh, this, the story still holds. So you, can, you can generate predictions. You can test those predictions and see whether the two are kind of uh, correspond to each other. OK. So the taxonomy, uh, very briefly, uh, when you say computational biology, that essentially means that anything and everything that uh, is related to uh, living uh, creatures uh, uh, and some, something that you want to count about, or you want something that you want to analyze, uh, uh, would belong to this kind of title. Uh, specifically within this, you would have uh, some subsets of computation by modeling, which is just a bunch of cells linked to each other, and how do they do, behave? Uh, computation evolution biology, you can imagine what that is. Computation, cancer computation biology, co computation pharmacology, computation genomics, something that uh, many people uh, uh, talk about today's, and computational neuroscience, which is the, the area where uh, we are going to focus now. So going down and, and on a tree, uh, uh, computational neuroscience could be break, uh, broken up to uh, molecular and cellular stuff. So this would be a, a subset of uh, um, research uh, fields that uh, uh, are related to the question of how certain molecules, how certain uh, cells in the brain behave the way they behave. Uh, and then something called system neuroscience, which is a uh, uh, the definition of system neuroscience is how different neural circuit analyzes sensory information from perception to the, of the external world to make decisions and execute motions or do anything, thinking uh, and all the higher order things if you dare to go there uh, with the uh, solid grounding in the, in, in the brain, in, in the tissue that you have in your head. Um, okay, so this is one way to go down. And then there's a completely other way to come from, which is kind of starts from psychology and long story short, it's, uh, one, there's a sub-area of psychology called cognitive science. And cognitive science would be something which uh, is concerned with the questions of how information is represented, pr processed, and transformed 
uh, and perception, language, memory, attention, anything that you consider higher cognition or lower cognition for that matter. Uh, uh, reasoning emotions within the nervous system. So the idea here is again, you can pursue those questions in a kind of purely um, behavioral standpoint, but more and more cognitive science is uh, itching toward uh, saying, yes, 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 that is all nice that you said and that you measured, but how is it done? How does the brain does that? So the marriage of the two, system neuroscience and cognitive science, will give you a kind of tool set, a kind of attitude uh, and approach, which you, then you can apply to for particular questions that you're interested in, particular uh, sub-areas. And so in, in our case, this is a, a, is a kind of um, resulted in uh, vision science, if you like. So vision science would be something where the questions are, uh, somehow related to uh, the process of that you have two eyes, you get some information in through the eyes, and somehow you understand the world. And anything in between is a big question mark. What is that? How is it happening? Why is it happening? Da, 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 da. And uh, if you want to solve questions in vision science, then you basically do two kind of things that somehow related to computation. One of them is uh, data analysis, and this would be quite sophisticated. It could go very simple from very simple to a quite sophisticated version of data analysis. Uh, so the, the present day's data mining and everything else is very heavily represented in that part. And computational modeling. And computational modeling would be something that you do, um, well, that you will see how you do it, for example. Uh, it essentially, you imagine how things could happen. Uh, you put together a model, and if the model is good, then it, it generates uh, viable predictions that you can test. So, so much about taxonomy. Uh, so now just one word about vision. So I already told you what vision is, but uh, to, to kind of substantiate what the problem with vision is, if there is any, is the following. So vision as we think or as we know is powerfully veridical. So that's, uh, in order to demonstrate that, some people run some experiments where they uh, paid a lot of money to MIT graduate students to sit in front of a monitor for five hours and they just flashed images at one after another in one second speed. So they saw basically 2,600 images completely randomly selected. And those images were something like these, right? So everyday objects, situations, mostly objects of particular types. And then they run three kind of experiments after this five and something hour uh, t uh, training, if you like, or a presentation. So they showed one thingy and they showed another thingy. And they, they asked them, which one have you seen in the last five hours? And the one thing it could be completely different from the other thingy, eh? and one of them was something that you saw the other thing not. Or the one thingy and the other thingy, eh? they were kind of exemplars of the same kind of uh, uh, categories. So you see a st uh, starfish or a starfish, or they could be actually exactly the same object, it just kind of differentially oriented and somehow changed some of the constellation of the, of the object. And uh, the results, long story short, is that uh, subjects, uh, and these are not just the bright MIT subjects, any subject who does that, they would perform in, in a range of 95% or so in all three tasks. So in essence, you see objects, enormous amount of things, completely randomly, and your brain somehow stores that. So you veridically store information with a huge quantity. On the other hand, we know that vision is invariant, which also means that if you see things like a picture here, when you have one person there, one person then, you have no problem with that. But of course, this person is the same size as this person, and here, you would see something different. So clearly, your representation and understanding what is in the, in the picture is very different, depending on the context. So it's not just simply veridical representation. It's a lot of distortion, a lot of changes that's happening due to something in your brain. And then you can just bring on all kind of other things, like color constancy, where if you select do, those two different patches in different contexts, they would look uh, very much uh, different. Uh, one of them is yellow, one of them is, is blue. But if you actually separate them from the context, then they, would be, they turn out to be exactly the same color. And so on and so on and so on. So there are many, many examples of that. So, facial representation or selective omission, actually, and selective omission, which is clearly two things that would be going against each other. Yet the brain does it in a particular way, which, which way is good for us, because then we can see and do things. And if you do it in the wrong way, then of course the, the whole thing wouldn't work. And the question is, how do we do that? So the old story, which is written there, you can see you don't, you don't even have to read it, standard models of how vision works. It, it, it comes from two different bases. One of them is uh, uh, the neural basis, and it says that, well, uh, you know, this is the picture why Hubel and Wiesel got their Nobel Prize uh, about 50 years ago. If you take a brain, you stick an electrode in there, you measure what's happening in, around the, that uh, 
electrode, then you will measure cell responses, and the cell responses will be very systematically encoding certain information. And uh, if you take a, a larger scale uh, investigation and you just shine some light or some kind of uh, other method on, on, the, on the surface of the brain, then you will see that uh, those different patches represent cells that do somewhat similar things, but somewhat different things too. Uh, and if you uh, measure the cells that you found with these needles in the brain, then you will see that they will have some preferred oriented segments. For example, you show a bar sweeping across the visual field. That way. They fire a lot. You, you do something else. You turn the orientation of that. They will fire less or they can even suppress the things. So in other words, there is some kind of encoding is happening here. And so at that point, when somebody says encoding, and you can go information theory, and, and many people did that, and try to analyze what the hell is going on there. And then if you step back on the system level, then what, uh, what people found that if you take the brain from the retina to a particular subcortical regions all the way to cortex, which is the major uh, play field for people who want to understand high order uh, cognition, and within the cortex you're kind of moving along uh, uh, certain paths, it turns out there is a hierarchy how areas are linked to other areas, and those areas kind of send information in a particular way, and they process that information in a particular way, and you can even uh, uh, claim that they, they do some abs abstraction in this process. So the question is, what the hell is happening there? Obviously, there should be the key to understand how we understand the world. And so if you take the, the cortex and, you know, that's a sheet, right? It's just crumbled. If you, if you just flatten it out, then it would look something like this. In, in, uh, and then if, if uh, from the eyes, uh, uh, fr through the LGN, you arrive to the cortex, then you will see these areas, V1, V2, V3, V4. So these are the visual areas of the brain. And, and if you trace what they do, then you can build computational models. And the computational models would somehow correspond to these different areas and would say, okay, V1 is doing something like this, V2 is doing something like this, and so on, and so on, and so on. Here we go. We understand how the brain works. So visual input comes in. There's a pipeline processing. Through the pipeline processing, you will have uh, uh, different uh, abstractions as you go from single line elements, a combination of those elements, somehow you'll get to the faces or, or any kind of complex uh, representations. And eventually you will be able to perform things like discrimination, categorization, identification, and all the things that we love, love to solve. This is something that's called the labeled line approach. It's a labeled line approach because what it uh, implicitly or explicitly says is that in any one level you have feature detectors those feature detectors detect their features and send information about that feature to the uh, uh, downstream so that you would be able to process that information. And so they behave as labeled lines. The labeled line says, yes, I see my feature. And the next level, we'll do some combination analysis and, and, and so on and so on and so on. Good. So this is the dominant view. This has been the dominant view for uh, basically from the beginning of times uh, until uh, mid or late 90s. Um, let's say early 90s, when uh, some cracks started to show up in, in the, this uh, story. And essentially, uh, the, the summary of the cracks can be said as this, as if you can read it. So life is uncertain and ambiguous. So what that means is that if you take any kind of, let's just imagine that these are some wire shapes, and you shine some light from above, then the wire shape will generate this kind of shadow on the surface. Okay. And as you can see, the same shadow can be produced in infinitely many different kind of wire shades. And so uh, the 3D reality out there and your 2D representation in your, in your uh, eyes, they, they're just not in one-to-one -one correspondence. And this is not just a weird story about uh, wire shapes and all that thing. It's actually true for everything. So if you take uh, the simplest possible visual stimulus, which is kind of a bright spot next to a kind of dark spot, which is called uh, the Gabor patch, uh, um, due to uh, Gabor, Dennis Gabor, the Hungarian uh, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, then, which is the, the major tool for, for testing uh, things in, in a visual system uh, experimentally. Then again, what you could say that I see an oriented segment kind of with disorientation, right? Th that's what you, if you are a labeled line, you would say that's what I see. But in reality, if all what you can convey is a kind of scalar uh, intensity measurement, how much you want to say, how, how loudly you want to speak, then the problem is that any combination of um, intensity and orientation could, in principle, even that, be a, a, a good answer to the question. So a priori, you do not know what, what, you, what is that you see. 
So the best solution in these situations where many combinations of, of different parameters can give you the, the correct answer is to encode both the values that you see and the uncertainty with the value. And once you, once you do that, you are uh, in the story of uh, performing probabilistic inference in the brain, which is a radically different story about how the brain works compared to what you just heard before. This is a story that has been in a kind of, uh, well, quite clear way presented a long time ago by Helmholtz, and then later on uh, people started to uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. But for par particular reasons, uh, the story always started, uh, stopped short in, in being uh, full-fledgedly uh, worked out, and basically one of the, 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 uh, the statements is that uh, today uh, we, we are in a situation where those uh, obstacles are more or less eliminated. So now, if you want to test whether this is something that's true about the brain, you can do that, which you couldn't do even 20 years ago. Okay, so just to present, uh, to kind of give a flavor of what I mean by probabilistic inference. So here's a very influential model that has been published prior to this kind of probabilistic story. Uh, it's uh, by two people from Nature, uh, in, in Nature when they published. And uh, the idea there is that if you have any kind of visual uh, stimulus X, then that could be encoded in a kind of basis function concept. So you have some basis functions, that's, that will be your label line detectors in your brain, and then some linear combination plus some noise will give you the encoding of, of that information. And whatever you want to do later on, you will use this information then. Probabilistically, the idea of the same kind of question, how would you encode the, the X information uh, uh, in, in the brain, would go like something like this. You haven't even seen your your uh, visual stimulus just yet, but you already have some uh, prior information, some prior assumptions about the two variables uh, y1 and y2, and here's the demonstrated in this blue uh, distribution, uh, this is the dark point, so essentially what this distribution says, if you want to characterize in words, is that uh, y1 and y2, they're basically sparse, so they're mostly around zero, and they're, they're more or less independent, so when one is on, the other is not on, right? Essentially. So now you get something uh, which is the, uh, uh, your likelihood function, which is the, uh, the, the probability of, of uh, seeing that what you see given particular combination of y1 and y2, and that will be that particular distribution that I told you. And so then you combine the prior and the likelihood and you will get the posterior. So the posterior is going to be again just a, um, um, a distribution which is the most likely uh, combination of, of those parameters that would give rise to, uh, to the percept that you see. And there, here, hence, this is an inference making, right? So we made some inferences based on the input that you came in. So uh, this is the old story posterior is, is a, a, um, related to the prior and the likelihood combination. And that will bring two important consequences. First, so we are not in labeled line word anymore, right? So this is now, if you want to believe in this, you have to say that the brain computes with distributions, computationally speaking. And that's a very different story, a much more complicated story than just saying the brain, you know, you have a detector and the detector turns on and it fires, turns off and it doesn't fire. It's, it's a different game. The second thing is, uh, so, yeah, and so they're not feature detectors anymore and uh, you have to compute with probabilities. I would shoot this slide here. Uh, uh, so the, the second thing, probabilistic inference requires a sufficiently correct internal model of the world. So think about that. Why would that be true? So if you, if you start with a prior, which you do, right? Uh, I, so I told you that uh, you have to start with priors. Uh, in principle, if the priors are wrong, you're dead. No. So if you, if you add any kind of information that is irrelevant to, to the input uh, incoming sensor information, you're making a mistake. So the only time this is going to work if your internal priors are correctly identified which means that you have to have a pretty good internal representation of what's going on or what would be going on in the next moment. Otherwise, the whole story just doesn't hold together. Um, so, yes, that's what I just said. Uh, so then the question is, what? What are we talking about? What is this internal prior? And so the idea there is the following. You have sensory stimulus and the sensory stimulus somehow coming from the objective reality where in which you have objects and features, they would be Y, and then those, those Ys would kind of generate some combinations of, of uh, uh, possible sensory, uh, sensory inputs, uh, uh, sensory uh, stimuli. Then you have your brain. And your brain needs to have an internal model which basically maps the world. It doesn't matter how, how precisely, how, um, yeah, how much in detail it does it, but it does to have 
uh, a map of the world. What the world is, how the world works. So therefore, you have to have some kind of internal representation of what objects are, what features are. You have to have some kind of internal representation how the world, how these objects and features are making up the world, and then also how these objects and features would generate any kind of percept. And when you turn that thing around, this is when you're making your inference. You're using your model in order to make the inference uh, about, uh, give, given the stimulus that you saw, about what kind of objects and features might be out there. So your, your, your ultimate goal is not to see, not to say what you see in, in terms of what are the, the visual stimuli that you see. Your ultimate goal is to say what are the causes of the, the, also, uh, the incoming stimulus. Okay. So, in other words, that's perceptual inference, which is uh, basically a prediction. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. We already talked 20 minutes or so. The question is, uh, very nice, what does it have to do with anything, right? So far, it was just kind of general presentation. So what it has to do with anything is that people, after a while, started to run experiments, mostly behavioral experiments, in which, uh, in different domains, uh, classical conditioning, perceptual processes, visual motor coordination, Q combination, decision making, high level cognitive process, all kind of things. And the result of this experiment was that not just since, since uh, the probabilistic framework is a very flexible, very good framework, so it can explain many things, right? So that's not a, not a surprise. But this, what the surprise was that uh, if you designed this experiment correctly, it seemed like as if people, that is humans and animals, by the way, uh, would behave in a way as if they did have internal representation of the world, as if they did do the optimal combination of prior knowledge and the incoming information in a, in a non-trivial situation, where you would say, otherwise you will go this way, but because if you do this and that combination, you'll go that way. So as if there was some kind of behavioral evidence that indeed the brain does this kind of uh, unconscious inference always in every and any process that it does. So it's all very good, but if it's true behaviorally, which is you know, the high level testing of things, the question is, yeah, 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 but we have the brain. So how does it do? How does the, the brain do it? And uh, in order to answer that, you have to have some kind of neural story about how inference making can be done in the brain, right? Okay, so where are we? We, we are done with that, with that, with that. So the next thing is, are we actually going to provide a hypothesis, how it could be done? Uh, so, in general, if the question is that you have uh, um, distributions and you want to represent distributions and you want to compute with distributions, what, how, would you, how could you represent distributions in general, mathematically speaking? This is a math department, so it's a good question. There are two ways of doing that. What are the two ways? With a function. Yeah. Other way, parametrically. Or? Explicitly meaning what? There's, that's semantic. You have to be very careful about semantic. So what is the other way? So parametric, what would be the opposite of parametric? Hmm. Let me think. Perhaps non-parametric? Okay, so those are the two ways you would do it, right? So assuming that you have a distribution, let's say this black distribution, the two ways you can actually represent the distribution. The parametric representation would be, you take a function and you say, well, it's basically that function, you know, give or take. And then you just parameterize the function and you keep the parameters of the function. So now you know what the distribution is as much as you know the parameters uh, and uh, you can compute with the distribution as much as you can compute with the, those parameters. So what is the non-parametric representation of the same story? Well, that is what's called sampling-based representation, right? So the idea is that I give you one sample from the distribution and a second sample of the distribution and then more and more samples, which is kind of following the, the, the actual distribution and so eventually, d through those samples, you do represent the entire distribution. It sounds like a little bit crazy idea, because why? So you would have like zillions of samples to represent the distribution, but just hang on. Uh, in principle, these are the two ways you can go. And so the suggestion that we have, that we had, uh, was that, uh, well, so how would it go in, in case of vision? So if you have this kind of uh, original story that I told you, you want to represent X and, uh, X and Y, uh, with Y1 and Y2, and that actual stimulus could be something in noise. Let's just take it to reality. So here is your, uh, your favorite building, and let's assume you have cells in your um, visual system, in, in your brain. And so what we know about the cells, so they have receptive fields. Receptive fields would be the area from where they are collecting information in order to do anything, right? So assume that you have two receptive fields, a blue one and a red one, 
One thing that we know about those cells is that if you, if you put up one stimulus, a, a steady state stimulus, those cells are never going to fire with one particular uh, value. So it's not like a turn on uh, a switch and they give five. What they do, they actually, despite the fact that there's a completely static input, they will do this. In time, they are going to have a time varying signal just ex exp uh, expressed. Okay, so let's see what is that we want to do. So we said we want to represent the distribution. So I'm just picking here another distribution. This, this one has two uh, maxima uh, for the sake of uh, fun. And so imagine that you have two, uh, two features that, that, are represent, that define uh, this uh, stimulus. And uh, this is the distribution that you want to represent. So clearly, given the stimulus, you want to figure out what is the probability of F1 and F2. So what we know that as time runs by, the cells, the cell responses, the joint probability of the cell responses is going to run through a particular path and is going to set up a particular distribution. So the whole, uh, in other words, uh, so the responses of the two cells are given the stimulus. They are also giving you a distribution. So the idea that we are trying to promote here is that that distribution is actually that distribution. In other words, the way the cells represent the distributions jointly is that as they co-vary with their stimuli, they are, they are, they're walking in a high-dimensional space, and in that high-dimensional space, they're actually providing your samples, right? So they're, they're walking in according to uh, the probability of, of what the underlying distribution would be. Is it clear? That means yes or no, because we're in different cultures, a different <laughs> meaning. <laughs> So well, what is not clear about that? So it, it, it is an assumption. This is the hypothesis that we are trying to promote. Well, if no, no objections, we move on. OK, so the, uh, the two points that uh, comes from this assumption is one of the, the cells jointly encode the, the likely nature of the stimulus. So r looking at, at one cell, you will never understand what the brain wants to say. You always have to know the, the joint probability. And the second one is that neural coding occurs in time, right? Because this, this thing has to walk. And, and so the, the, uh, you, know, you are talking about a dynamical system that, that needs to present whatever it wants to present in time. Okay, so now we take a little bit of detour for the sake of substantiating this, this idea. So the detour is coming from uh, a, a simple question. We do know that the brain has spontaneous activity. Whenever you sleep, whenever you do nothing, whenever you're sitting in a, in a boring lecture, your brain is active and it's actually almost as active or it's just very active. Let's just leave it at that. So the question is, what the hell is that? What is that spontaneous, acti spontaneous activity, right? Which is not driven by the input. And in case of vision, and in case of the primary visual cortex, which is the, the first visual cortex in, in this pipeline that I just told you, um, that's kind of well-defined. If you don't see anything, then, but you still have activity in the primary visual cortex, it means that visual cortex is doing some spontaneous stuff, which has nothing to do with visual input, right? Question is, what is that? And the common wisdom for, for that uh, kind of activity always been, oh, it's noise. Unfortunately, the brain is noisy. Um, so we run an experiment in which uh, we, we took um, ferrets and we stick electrode in their, in their, in their head and they rec record it from the brain, from the primary visual cortex. And the ferrets are, are great animals because they open their eyes at P30, so 30 days after they are born. Until then, they have nothing. They, they're kind of closed eyes uh, living in, in, with their mom. And then within this period of uh, 15 days later, another 45 days later, uh, the visual system basically gets wired together. And then the animal is running happily and it works the way it's supposed to. So we have this multi electrode recording from V1 at three different age groups, P30, 30, 45, and 90. And we show them three, dif show them three different types of stimuli, nothing. So they were sitting in complete darkness, uh, random dynamic noise, so it's a frame rate uh, upgraded um, block noise, and a natural movie, which we selected to be the matrix. Uh, so the, the ferret is sitting there, it's, it's, it doesn't turn its head, it's a huge monitor and just either sees the movie or sees some kind of random thing or sees nothing and everything is turned off, so it's sitting in complete darkness. So you would imagine these are slightly different conditions visually speaking, right? Okay, so the, summarizing the, the results, in, in one complicated graph. So here you have um, the temporal correlation and here you have the spatial correlation things. Here you have the three different age groups and the lines which are on top of each other, they would be the three different conditions of uh, the three different stimuli, okay? And so, so this is essentially an autocorrelation function 
um, in time. And this is the youngest animal. And what you can see here, basically two messages coming out from this very slightly complicated graph. The one is that if you look at uh, the patterns, you see this kind of uh, sluggishly dropping thing getting sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper in the temporal domain, and then sluggishly dropping thing getting f flatter, flatter, and higher in the spatial domain, which we saw in every single animal. The other thing that we saw, and you can see too, that sitting in complete darkness or watching the movie, your brain correlations basically don't change. They do exactly the same thing, or almost exactly the same thing. Uh, so there's a systematic change in correlation structure with age, and there is a minimal difference between the structures of spontaneous activity, uh, during, uh, in the structures of spontaneous and the evoked activity, which is kind of worrisome, because if this is true, then how does this animal see, right? I mean, if I see something, there's some kind of correlation uh, in, my, in my brain due to the thing that I see. Then I see nothing. And there's some kind of correlation in my brain, which is exactly the same kind of correlation in, than I get when I see something. So when do I know that I see something uh, versus I know nothing about anything? So that brings the question, is spontaneous activity really noise? And that takes us quite, quite long, uh, on a quite long road, because then we can turn the thing around and we can say, no, it's not a noise. But then what? So let's give a functional role of this spontaneous activity. And so the functional role will come from the, the idea of what functional role we can give comes from two sources. One of them is a physiology, the other one is, uh, is behavioral studies. Physiology is uh, uh, that some people sometimes back in, uh, uh, in 96, apparently, uh, they measured again this kind of stuff in the brain, the sticking electrodes, it, this, this time it was a cat, da da da, and they found a bunch of cells that behaved exactly the way that Hubel and Wiesel described a very long time ago you know, oriented things are sweeping in, in front of your nose, you're firing, you're not firing, as you turn around, you're firing less, blah, blah, blah. So everything is fine. Except that there were a small but significant subset of cells that couldn't give a damn about sweeping and turning and all that thing. They liked the ambient light. If you had ambient light up, they fired happily. If ambient light down, they didn't fire at all. Okay, the other uh, piece of evidence is coming from this thing here. So if you look at these two patches again, this is the same story that I just show you with, with uh, color, illusions and, and, and uh, constancies. You would, how many of you see this thing be different in terms of brightness, the two spots? One? Uh, I wanted to suggest all of you should go to vision, <laughs> some kind of <laughs> vision doctor. Yes, yeah, so these are very different. It's a very strong, uh, reliable illusion. In reality, of course, they are exactly the same. But because of the context, and this context is not even just a, a uh, small neighboring context, but it's just the shadows. It's a very high level cognitive context, right? The shadow was casted on, on this plate, and therefore this thing is actually, should be higher than that, that, that thing. So these kind of things, again, see that as if there was some kind of overall gain control in the story. Uh, depending on your context, you're pushing things up or down. Okay, we're going well. So how to implement the, this whole thing in a probabilistic model? So back to our favorite model. All what we need to do, and this is essentially saying that you factorize the, the, uh, your coding. So you have something that deals with features and something that deals with the ambient light, right? And here you have it. So you just add another variable, which would be B, brightness. And so that brightness is, is taking care of uh, your, your, uh, your ambient light coding, and the rest is taking care of some feature or stuff that you have in the, in the image. Uh, so that is great because if you want to do that in, in a probabilistic method, then I can give you your first exercise of, the, of this talk. So remember, uh, the story was that if you have a nice lit uh, room and you have these kind of uh, coders, uh, then the B brightness will tell you that the ambient light is high, so that that scalar is going to be at the high end of, this, uh, of its distribution. And the two other guys do their business, right? So they're encoding the oriented uh, feature that they see. Clear? Question, what happens if I turn the light halfway down? The ambient light. This is a purely mathematical question. So the coding is factorial. You have a scalar that takes care of the, uh, of the ambient light. You have uh, the, a feature thing that is, is encoded probabilistically. What, what will happen to this parameter? What will happen to this distribution? Any brave soul? Well, what? The brightness parameter will go down. Yes. That's 
That's not rocket science. The other part is also not rocket science. So uh, what happens to the other thing? I guess the, the variance Yes, exactly. So in that case, what you have, this guy is going to encode uh, the, the area, uh, I mean the, the ambient light, uh, faithfully. So that's why we have less light. And the other guys, they actually encode the same stuff that they encoded. So nothing really changed, right? So the code, the information is there. Just the evidence became weaker. So your distribution, your posterior, is going to be uh, more widespread. Because you had the prior, the prior was fine. You change the likelihood. You're not quite sure what's going on because of this thing. Your posterior is going to be somewhat wider than it used to be before, right? So now, the really interesting question. What happens if I turn off the light? Same logic. What could possibly happen to this one? All the way down, right? But, but you can't see the shape anymore. Yes. <coughs> so what happens then? Yes. All what you got is your prior knowledge. In other words, the thing that you would measure here is basically your prior. Because there is nothing in, in terms of likelihood coming into the business, right? So that's interesting because what is exactly that you're measuring when you turn off the light? That is what you call spontaneous activity. In other words, so if this is true, then if I turn off the light, I should be get some, getting some information about my spontaneous activity, which is interesting because if that's the functional rule that we want to give, uh, we want to uh, say that activity PY given uh, X is an, in an absence of the input stimulus X represents samples from the prior and this is the spontaneous activity. That's a great statement because that actually is testable, right? Because if you, if you just write up uh, normally th this tautology essentially, the how you compute the PY and you substitute uh, with uh, the situation that we have, which is that uh, the, the integral goes to summation or uh, the, the PY even gets is a walked activity, uh, the averaging goes over all natural scenes, the all data that you can have, and the P, P of Y is, is just a spontaneous activity, then this thing means that, well, perhaps not from the beginning, but after some learning, you need to have this equation holding up. So this is interesting for two, two reasons. One is because it kind of explains the previous experiment. It says, well, yeah, of course you will go, you're going to see the same kind of correlations. You are talking about the same kind of stuff, more or less. And, and uh, the B, it gives you very clear predictions that you can test, which is, with accumulating visual experience, the distribution of spontaneous activity should become increasingly similar to the distribution of evoked activity averaged over natural stimuli, all natural stimuli, that's important. So not one-to-one -one mapping, but the, the statistically speaking, the average should be the same. And eventually it should match it. So the, the three predictions that we can draw, probability of exhibiting a given net, uh, neural activity pattern should be identical between the spontaneous and the evoked activity in, in the adult animal, because this is where your internal model is basically ready, right? You're done with that. Second, this match should emerge gradually, because it's just no way that you come out from, from the one uh, with all the knowledge about the world. So that has to be somehow tuned due to experience. And third, uh, this similarity should be specific to natural scenes, right? We did talk about that. We said that uh, you would not be able to uh, use your prior correctly if the prior is not correct. So the prior that you're honing on your visual, uh, uh, your visual uh, system is all natural scenes, the natural environment that you have, which means if I show you a non-natural environment, it shouldn't work. I mean, because the average is, is just kind of getting somehow concentrated on a subset of the entire uh, possible patterns of uh, activities. So let's do an experiment here. So we did, did that experiment. And um, it's basically the same story as before. Now you have the animals, but now just four age group instead of three, four different type of uh, stimuli, dark, movie, drifting grating. So these are kind of these lines that are kind of drifting in one direction. And, and the random noise, as before. And just to capture one more time the point, uh, the rationale of the experiment is this. If you take an animal and you show them all kinds of images which kind of reasonably spans uh, the space of, of natural scenes that you, uh, they would encounter in terms of V1, and we can get back to that, uh, what does it mean? Then for each of those natural scenes that you show that, they, they are going to produce some kind of pattern of activity in their brain, right? And then you can average those patterns of activity, so you will have an average patterns of activity. And then you, you have the same animal and show them darkness, nothingness, and, they are, and they, they are going to generate some kind of spontaneous activity distribution, and those two should be completely identical.
in um, second, in the young animal, that should not be the case, right? So the young animal sees whatever it sees. So that should be different, whatever you can generate from spontaneous and generate from the evoked activity. But in time, there should be a convergence from young to adult animals. So you should see this kind of uh, difference to diminish as, as age goes by. And thirdly, uh, if you replace the images with some kind of weirdo images like this, rather than stretching the entire space of natural scenes, then that match should not be the case. You, it, it should be only true for natural images. These are the three combinations that we had. Then we, oh yeah, so how do we do the data analysis? Here, here is your mathematical uh, uh, plugin. So you just basically record in time from 16 electrodes. Uh, so 16 electrodes in time. Uh, white means that they are really active, black they are not so active. That's a 16 dimensional vector and you can uh, kind of binarize it in two, two millisecond bins. So you, in every two millisecond, you have a vector with zeros and ones, fire or no fire. And with this, this binary code then, oops, no. With this binary code then, you can, you can generate a histogram. So the histogram would tell you that how many times vertical patterns uh, happened during this period of measurement. And then those two histograms should be compared with a KL divergence, or, uh, which is a kind of natural choice for this kind of comparison. And if the predictions are correct, those, the, those should be the same, right? So we did that, and here are the results. Uh, yes, spontaneous activity, evoked activity in the movie condition converge with age, and in the adult animal, they do not differ significantly. Here is the corresponding graph, movie and spontaneous. This is the KL divergence, this is age groups, and you can see the difference uh, is, uh, is quite significant at the beginning, and it goes down, 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 and this is actually where I should have had a, a dashed line. So that is indistinguishable from what would you get if you do the KL matching with itself. So that's kind of a measure, measuring mistake. So it's essentially the same. And the match is, is uh, specific to natural stimuli because if you do the same kind of stuff, not for a movie, but uh, um, comparing the KL between uh, spontaneous and, and uh, um, a noise or spontaneous and, and gratings, then at the beginning they go together, but by the end of the, the time, the other two will be significantly different. So they do not get down to the same level as, the, uh, uh, as what you would get with natural scenes. Okay, okay. So, the sampling hypothesis and spontaneous activity, including the, the concepts of, uh, of how theory provides predictions and how predictions then can be uh, uh, brought back to um, um, testing and, and confirming, we covered that. And now we have a little bit of time and a little bit of thing to go. So, I, I'll give you one more ex a, a piece of experience. This is perhaps a little bit less interesting, but it's, it's kind of uh, a finishing the concept that we just had. So this is a question of visual experience. So one could say that the, all what we see in, in terms of those convergences, this is just due to the fact that uh, mother nature is smart and kind of tweak things in there and, you know, you, if you wait, you will get there no matter what, because that's the way it goes. The other possibility is that no, you actually have to have that visual experience to get that convergence. If you don't get the visual experience, you don't get the, the uh, convergence. So the, the next story is uh, about how to test that. And uh, as you can imagine, it's kind of pretty simple. Uh, so visual experience, th this is a contagious uh, um, topic. Uh, people were investigating in all kinds of things. They investigated how neural maps develop. Remember those kind of patchy things I showed at the beginning. The question is how they come around. Uh, then uh, selectivity, how the cells get their selectivity. So there are some bunch of experiments uh, and theories about that. Uh, then neurodynamics, uh, so this would be the story of uh, homeostatic adjustment. So if you use the system a lot, then it kind of tunes back. If you use the system a little bit, then it, can, it ramps up things. So this is uh, the dynamic balance thing. But nobody ever asked the question in terms of neurocomputation. So the computation is exactly the question that I told you. Is this experience necessary for having a system to be able to perform correctly in the world? Right? That's a different issue for all of the previous ones, basically. So then the question is, what is lost after deprivation? So deprivation when you don't have the experience. And can we have any kind of good measurement of this loss? And so uh, just to recap what we had in the previous experiment, this is exactly the same thing that we had before. I'm just showing the same results, the normal controls, but only with um, um, uh, noise. So I just left out the gratings. So we have three conditions, spontaneous, movie, and noise. And this is the decreasing thing. And as you can see that uh, uh, the movie and spontaneous, this is the decreasing thing that I showed you, but movie with itself, it's kind of flattens out, it hangs around down there. 
uh, this is what we are, um, uh, yeah, this is what we call KL complete, delta KL complete. Uh, and this is a spatial domain, and you can have exactly the same measurement in a temporal domain. I didn't talk about that, but believe me, that works the same way. So, essentially, uh, the result here is that the, in terms of KL complete, there is no difference at the end of the, of the older stage uh, between computing the KL between movie and spontaneous or movie and itself. You have no difference. Whereas if you compute a, a movie and spontaneous and, and, and noise and spontaneous, there you have uh, a, a substantial difference, which is what I will call KL specific. And so the question is what happens if you remove visual experience from the life of these animals? And so we run the experiment, and the experiment is very much the same as you had before. The only difference is that now the animals, when they wanted to open their eyes, we kind of suture their eyes, so they can't, can't see any, anymore until the moment of the experiment. So they live, they're happy, there's no problem with them, but they don't see anything uh, until the point of, of, uh, of the experiment. So if you do that, uh, everything else is the same, basically you're recording, you're doing all the same stuff, then the results can be broken down to two points. The first point is that the basic measurement that you can have with this kind of uh, situations, one of them is firing rate, so how much the cells are firing, or lifetime sparseness. So what is the sparseness, uh, how sparse the, 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 uh, the signal that they give, and there are different versions of this lifetime sparseness, which is an individual sparseness of individual cells, or population sparseness, which computes sparseness on, on, on a vector of, of, uh, of cells. Uh, or and just simply entropy. So if you do all those things and you can look at the controls and the literature, what you can see, the three lines are the spontaneous movie and noise. Basically, there's no difference. So here are animals that for, uh, for a good uh, um, time of, of three months haven't seen anything normally. Yet, these measurements here, they show no difference between the two. Right? Okay. So let's move on. What about the KL, our favorite KL uh, measurements? So if you do that, this was the control, remember, spatial, temporal, the KL complete, the KL uh, specific. Here's what you get with the lit suture. And what you see there is that every single place, things completely reversed. What used to be equal is different. What used to be different becomes equal. And if you want to represent it another way, it's ba basically a double dissociation between the lit sutures and the controls, given the complete and the specific things. In other words, you, you, moved, you took away uh, visual experience and the way they encode information as it manifested in the correlational structure of, of their brain uh, activities completely changed. Not the generic thing, so the brain is healthy, the brain is working, the brain is doing all kinds of stuff, but in terms of encoding the information that it's supposed to encode, they do a completely different job. Okay? Blah, 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 blah. So therefore, uh, 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 the uh, visual experience is an important aspect of functional development.